that they could potentially damage it with more movement than they would otherwise if they felt the pain. So what might stay in a bag is not necessarily always what's inside the product in terms of different ingredients being changed throughout the seasons. And the feeding choices we make for our horses either puts them one step closer to health or one step closer to disease. Welcome everyone to episode 98 of the Send Nutrition Podcast with your host Brian and Peter today. And today's topic is diet-related laminitis. What are the causes and what are the ways to prevent this from happening? How are you, Peter? I'm pretty good today. It's a bit, um, it's a bit cooler than normal, so I think it's, uh, you know what time it might be. <laughs> We're straight in, straight into the gin jokes. <laughs> no, we'll cut the gin jokes for a week. <laughs> They're all right. Yeah, I think this this topic that we're going to tackle today, this there is a wealth of information out there regarding laminitis as a whole. So you've got the mechanical and you've got the nutrition related, but today we're going to concentrate on the nutrition or the diet related side because there's so many influences and steps that even a young horse that is not laminitic, there's now evidence that having high NSC diets, the sugars and starches in the diets, they can be predisposed to metabolic conditions later on in life. Yeah, and as you said, Ron, the NSC for our annual listeners, that's the nonstructural carbohydrates, which is the sugar and starches, as Brian mentioned. Um, it's a bit of a minefield for a lot of horse owners because more particularly in Australia, I'm not sure how the US is, and just a big hello to our American listeners. I think you're about 7 or 8% of our, of our fan club, if I can call it. So a big hello to you guys. Hopefully we're in America one day. Yeah. Um, but just getting back onto the topic, it's, it's a bit of a minefield in terms of of the nutrition because the industry it, it's not hugely regulated and we'll go into what might say in a bag is not necessarily always what's inside the product in terms of different ingredients being changed throughout the seasons and and obviously you, you know it is a common practice for some companies it's not for others um, so we'll go into why you need to look out for for obviously different ingredients and and you know with laminitis and diet related as well. You might not see those issues in a younger horse, but as the horse gets older and it matures, a, a lot of those things, I wouldn't say were neglected as a younger horse, come to fruition as, a, as an older horse. And then you've got to try to manage the problem. And in some cases, it might be too late. Yeah, 100%, Peter. There's, there's something we'll enlighten our listeners, listeners to with the technicality term with seasonal in inverted commas with ingredients. But uh, let's just start at the very basics for any horse owner understanding what laminitis is. So laminitis is where the laminae structure is inflamed and this is located inside the hoof capsule between the pedal bone and the hoof wall. And when a horse has laminitis, this is affected by a lot of inflammation and the whole structural integrity is compromised and damaged. And it's a horrible condition that, that we hope less and less horses as nutrition and research goes into this gets less by the day. Yeah, Brian, it's very well said. And you did sort of nail a keyword, the inflammation. So what you're feeding does either, you know, promote inflammation or it does not promote inflammation. So where we come from centers, we want to get as much obviously fiber and as much fat into the diet because both fat and fiber are, are anti-inflammatory, obviously depending on what fat you feed as well. So you've got, you know, fats that are high in omega-6 and you've got, which are pro-inflammatory and you've got fats that are, that are high in omega-3, which are, which are anti-inflammatory. So this is where sort of getting the balance of the diet right um, will, you know, will help your horse or, or it will hinder your horse. Yeah, and with the diet in terms of horses that are predisposed to laminitis, for those that are overweight, with crusty necks, fat deposits, the ones that suffer from metabolic conditions, and that's like PSSM, insulin dysregulation, and equine metabolic syndrome, these are all potential risks to develop laminitis, and this is what we're trying to limit. And also, when you look at full sugar and starch influence on laminitis, that's when there's an overload into the hindgut, and then there's a cascade of events that really disrupt the blood flow into that into all the vessels in the laminate and that's when that damage happens in in that hoof so brian for some of our listeners out there obviously you know not knowing sort of too much about nutrition and you know like, you know getting told by friends and family oh well you know you should be feeding this or you should be feeding that is there any sort of red flags or any alarm bells that that maybe you can let our listeners know to look out for yeah so firstly we're looking at the nsc so the non-structural carbohydrates in the diet it's as a percentage and for a laminitic prone horse or a horse with laminitis, 
you want this as low as possible with the whole foundation of the diet, hay or pasture, including the hard feed, to be less than 12% or even even better, 10%. So let's look at grains first. Grains are absolutely out of the question. Corn is an NSC percentage of over 70%. Oats is over 50%. So they are definitely not needed. And even for a healthy horse, these, these grains are really not required in a horse doing the workload of probably less than what a racehorse is doing in that daily training. And and we even recommend in that setting to lower the grain ration and get more fat and fibre for performance. But getting back to laminitis, so what we're looking for is your pasture or a grassy hay to be below 12%, then balance that up with a quality hard feed that has the lowest NSC percentage as possible and I'll explain the breakdown of this NSC percentage further on as it gets a little bit more complicated. Yeah, and that 10% NSC that you mentioned, that goes as well for hay. So we haven't sort of jumped onto that yet, which we will cover next. But yeah, look for a for a feed that's that's below the 10% NSC. And look, as a, as a little cheat sheet or as a little trick here, look for high fibre feeds. So if you are feeding a commercial horse feed, the, the easiest way to know whether it's going to be high in sugar or low in sugar is by the fiber level. So the fiber, the crude fiber is the most important part. So when you go high, the fiber, let's just say 30, 35% fiber, it's, you know, I'll guarantee everyone that it's going to be below 10% NSC. If, you, if you've if you got a feed that you're feeding your, your horse that's 10% fiber, look, chances are that NSC is going to be between 20 and 30%. So like as a rule of thumb, um, just keep that in mind for that for the fiber percentage. Yeah, and our listeners may have come across some terms within that, non-structural carbohydrates so the nsc that it is the wsc so water soluble carbohydrates plus starch a lot of horse owners if the horse is insulin resistant or has elevated insulin will actually take note of the esc plus the starch and this really should be under 10 percent. so a esc is ethanol soluble carbohydrate and basically they consist of short chain and small molecule sugars which are rapidly digested and are critical with insulin resistance. So they cause the blood insulin to rise really rapidly. And if you can aim for that ESC, aim to get it tested on your hay, especially, and get that to the lowest level as you can. And all grassy hays have really good lower levels of this. Brian, I'm getting a headache and just even trying to digest what you just said with the ESC and everything. So <laughs> if, if anyone's in doubt, they can they can call the, the office because we can go through it with them. If, if you're feeling overwhelmed, and as Peter and I were discussing before with one client, asking a vet about nutrition advice does not really make sense because the vet module with nutrition is not longer than a month or two months, whereas what we're doing, we're doing this every day, day in, day out, and following the world leaders with nutrition and holistic views of it. Yeah, and look, we're not here to bash vets, and and look, there's a you know there's a time and a place for for, for veterinary work as well. But look, vets are trained to to deal with disease. You know, they're not trained in promoting health. And what I mean by promoting health is through proper nutrition, and that's where I think something like us comes in. You're 100 percent right, Peter. We're not just saying this without any reasoning. So. When you look at the treatment of inflammation and pain with laminitis, yes, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have a, a great effect in making the horse more comfortable. But there's another way of looking at this, and it's about the whole physical aspect of the hoof. You have a very heavy animal, and if pain is being blocked, the laminae, which is very fragile, it's it's a healing tissue in these inflammation events, that they could potentially damage it with more movement than they would otherwise if they felt the pain. So there is a fine line between comfort and pain for the horse and it is a devastating condition that no one wants to see. So it's just being mindful of the management with those anti-inflammatories and the movement of the horse in that stall rest. Yeah, that's a valid point and I'll I'll put that into equation sort of for human health and it's as an example be if I'm playing basketball and you know I've rolled my ankle and obviously now I'm limping it's 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 swollen you know maybe after you know one or two days I take a you know I take a painkiller or, or anti steroidal anti-inflammatory and and I mean you know my ankle feels like it's like it's brand new but yet the swelling's still there so I go back to basketball and I keep playing and running and then eventually you know I tear a ligament because I shouldn't be overexerting myself so 
you know, the point of the matter is that, yeah, just by masking the pain, you're not actually getting to the root cause of the problem. You are making life easier for that for that horse or that or that animal or, or even for us. But it's sort of it's sort of like robbing Peter to pay Paul because you're taking a pain away, but the injury is still there. So if you if you don't feel the pain, you know, pain's there for a reason. We're born with pain and it's and it's smokers, hey, just hold up here, you need to rest, need to recover. It's not to go to go through the pain where you can cause further serious injury possibly. Yeah, exactly, Peter. We know each individual horse will have individual circumstances. It can be there to keep them more comfortable, but if you are keeping them comfortable, they ha- they'll have to be under a close watch, particularly when in severe cases of laminitis. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, Brian. Um, Brian, what's the next point you'd like to cover? Probably the next point we need to touch on with diet and laminitis is the feed nutrient profile. So when you're looking at your feeding foundations for a laminitic prone horse, you need to ensure obviously the sugars and starches are at a, a good level or a low level. Here at Sen, we put ourselves with a full 100% grain free formula that has that high fiber, as Pete mentioned before, but our starch is less than 1%. Our NSC is around the 5% mark, and this is a safe addition to any horse diet not only the laminitic prone also setting them up for life metabolically if you're feeding it to a younger horse but when you look at even the vitamin mineral profile with this safe starch and sugar level there has been some great debate over the iron levels and at send we don't add any iron to our feeds there's other fiber feeds out there like the beet pulps are really high in iron and what we know is a horse can't excrete iron there's an abundance of iron in our soils in australia which comes through with our hay and pasture so there's no real need to over supplement this so looking at fiber sources that have lower iron levels is going to be of more benefit to the horse yeah, especially in Australia, as you said, Brian, the, the iron is rampant sort of everywhere and it's, it's all, you know, most of the hays that are out there in a lot of the pastures, just sort of steering onto the hay side, hays to avoid are your oat and hays, your, your barleys, your wheat and, and, your, and your rice, all these are, you know, pretty high in sugar. The ones we do want to promote are your, are your grassy hays, whether it's the rose, um, whether it's the rose grass, you're looking at a coxfoot hay, um, velt grass, obviously, like in, in Victoria, and there are a few other ones there as well, but um it's it's paramount to look at your sugar and starch as a combination of the feed rather than nitpicking each individual uh, product itself because it's it's almost like a process of accumulation. You know, you might be like you might be you know trying to feed half a kilo of a, of a high fiber feed, but yet you know you're feeding ad lib uh, a barley hay. I mean that that half a kilo of fiber ain't gonna help the the ad lib barley if that if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it has to be even across the board to have the the best effect and. Even with horses that don't have metabolic issues, we are looking at trying to get as much fibre into that diet because that's what their physiology is designed for to actually promote health in every body system of the horse. Going back onto that iron, we're not saying it does cause the metabolic syndrome or the laminitis, but the research that is being looked at at the moment is there is evidence of a connection that it is not beneficial to have iron overload when you already have an insulin-resistant laminitic prone horse and brian it's almost like playing russian roulette you know it's not worth the risk to to find out whether your horse is going to have any sort of uh you know impact from the high iron so it's it's best to sort of you know stay clear of as i mentioned before a lot of the hays and soils in australia are already high in iron so there's no need to feed a beet pot product which is imported anyway from from overseas that's that's already high in iron yeah. and peter and i's aim with sen was to simplify everyone's feed so We take the guesswork out of it with our nutrient profiles. We have a fixed recipe or fixed formulation because it's made in Australia. We're we're supporting the Australian farmers. Our ingredient list isn't 10 pages long. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but (laughs) if, if you're looking at ingredients on the back of a bag, there is this little loophole, as we mentioned before, at the start of this podcast, where a company can substitute a seasonal ingredient because it's gone out of season without actually notifying the customer. Yeah, correct. And look, we've only got two ingredients because we feel like less is more. So obviously, you know, we don't want to put any unnecessary sort of fillers and carriers into our product. Not saying that's what anyone else does, but when you when you only have two ingredients, very seldom are you going to run out of you know run out of stock of those two ingredients. Um, we have had some customers, um, obviously, that are now sent customers that were 
customers of previous feed companies that they were mentioning that a lot of the the feeds were changing pretty much every every batch that they got. It, it would look different, it would smell different, the colour would be different. And as Brian just touched on, it is it is because of the seasonal change of ingredients. Um, look, some companies we we have heard as well. There's some grains coming out from from overseas, from from different parts of the world, um, just because obviously everything's going up and price. Australian grains are going up as well. So, you know, there are grains coming in from from overseas, which some companies are choosing to use just to obviously you know try to absorb maybe some of the some of the costs. But we don't know whether those grains are the same quality, whether they're GMO, whether they're non-GMO. You know, every country's got different processes. Australia's got really really strict um, quality control. So, hence why we you know we choose to use only Australian made um well 100 australian grown ingredients i should say yeah 100 peter what our listeners have to look out for is if you've got another ingredient in brackets after a particular ingredient or an asterisk but even so even on their website they can actually uh just say that just make a statement that we use seasonal ingredients where available whereas at send we do not do that we want to keep each batch at the highest quality and have the most balanced nutrient profile that is beneficial for the horse not just to take shortcuts just because some ingredient is out of stock yeah that's 100 percent well said brian and look people obviously that are using our products or considering using our products that's the guarantee you get with us that we guarantee that the ingredients that we use will not change ever so we can't talk about other companies but but that is something that that, that we promote and it's something that we're proud of as well and as an example you know let's just say seasonal ingredients let's say argument's sake that there might be a you know a competitor company of ours that's that has got a you know low gi or a low sugar or a low starch feed that that might be around about the 15 percent when i change those seasonal ingredients that particular feed might go up to 20 25 you know god forbid 30 percent um and you know they're within their rights to do it because the seasonal ingredient that's high in fiber is not the seasonal ingredient that that might be um you know available in a winter time or, or springtime so you know if you're using that particular feed you might be doing well in the summertime but you're not doing well in a winter time where with sand you don't take that risk because we don't change the ingredients 365 days a year it's the same ingredients the whole year round yeah Pete, it's something we're really proud of supporting the australian local farmers and keeping that ingredient list and not being seasonal yeah when we created obviously all the all the products we we were mindful about that obviously as we grow there's going to be a bigger need and demand for it so we just wanted to a keep it simple but but b as i said just using 100 percent australian grown ingredients because we know that the soils in australia are, are really well in certain areas um and and obviously for the ingredients that that we use we you know we have nothing but praise yeah you spot on peter the, the other point with laminitis is the obesity issue and we're trying to avoid a horse being overweight by providing a nutrient profile that is higher in fiber and fat rather than that sugar and starch and there's developing research in this in terms of building condition in a horse with sugar and starch compared to higher fiber is leading to sort of a predisposition of insulin resistance later on in the horse's life and that's nearly relatable in human terms with diabetes and it's something we're quite passionate about trying to educate horse owners to feed according to physiology because the horse is ultimately a fiber fermenter and this is what should be promoted over sugar and starch to increase condition or maintain condition yeah that's well said and look i'll give our listeners an example brian it might be a skinny horse that someone has bought or or inherited obviously from you know from another owner and the knee-jerk reaction would be all right look you know we need to put weight on this horse because you, you know you feel sorry for the horse it's got ribs it just hasn't got any top line so you know they reach out it might be mill run it might be barley or it might be a feed that's got both of those ingredients and you know maybe the horse is going to do really well because it's just like it's lacking those calories you know like sugar and starch or put weight on i won't say it's a healthy weight it's it's, it's probably going to put fat on a horse a lot quicker than you're going to do through fiber and fat as Brian said, with, with, with them being fibre fermenters. So then what will happen is it's it's like a cascade of events. That owner will think, oh, well, you know, that feed I had is is the silver bullet and it's, it's put the weight on, the horse is looking beautiful. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy inside, even though that it's big. And then that horse will be on that diet for possibly five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. And then it gets to a point where that accumulation of sugar and starch has actually caused damage inside and that 
horse, God forbid, gets gets laminitis or insulin resistance, what so forth, then you've got a disease. And now you're going to be spending thousands and thousands of, of dollars with vets and everything like that to try to manage that disease where you might possibly not be able to turn it around. So what we advocate for is is obviously prevention is better than cure. So initially in that in that same scenario, it might take you three months or, or, or four months longer to get that top line, get that condition on feeding a high fat and a high fibre diet. So now that horse is going to be on that high fat, high fibre diet for the, for the rest of its life. And nine times out of 10, it's not going to develop any of those insulin resistance or, or, or even laminitis. So this is where we're very passionate about preventing, um, you know, using using healthy diet for prevention rather than, than feeding unhealthy and then treating the symptoms at, at the end of that horse's life. Yeah, 100% agree, Peter. What we are seeing is even taking another step back, providing a high fiber, low sugar, low starch to all horses, including right back when they're born. So when you feed a, a broodmare, and this is the research coming through on this, if you feed a broodmare a high fiber, low sugar, low starch diet, the risk of developmental orthopedic disease in the foal is a lot less. And you actually have a, a healthier mother and foal body system to then progress through to their growth rate of a foal, a weanling and a yearling, and I'll leave the research paper link in the show notes, is when they're fed a high fibre balanced diet compared to a grain or a traditional high grain diet, their growth rates were the same, but the foal's hind gut was less acidic and their whole gastrointestinal tract was in better condition than than this. And it also has a big link with behavior. So you're going to have a better behaved or temperament horse setting them up with a high fiber, low sugar, low starch diet. Look, and that makes absolute sense to me. So as we all know that horses are vegetarians, they're fiber fermenters. So, you know, how I look at it is that, well, if you're going to feed a vegetarian or a fiber fermenter, a lot of grain, how is that going to benefit the actual horse? Because you're, you know, you're going against nature, you're going against its its genetics, and I'm still waiting for someone to prove me wrong about how a high grain diet for, you know, older horses, younger horses, all horses, obviously, you know, apart from performance horses where they might need some of the, you know, some of that carbohydrates, obviously, because they're, you know, they're exercising a lot harder, going a lot quicker, so they can use up the extra the extra sugar and starch. It's more towards, obviously, like you said, the broodmare and the foal and, 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 you know, even a pleasure horse. So I, you know, I echo your thoughts in regards to the, to the high fiber balanced diet. Um, and we're still waiting to be proven wrong on that. When we consult a lot of the leading stud farms in Australia, in particularly in the thoroughbred world, there is a shift to this lower sugar, lower starch profile. And they're recognizing the research and moving with the times because I think Peter back in in the day like seven eight nine years ago when we were consulting i think they looked at us quite funny us suggesting a high fiber low sugar low starch as a research it was quite in its infancy level yeah i i was just thought maybe they thought we were speaking a different language they couldn't understand what we were saying but um Look, but all jokes aside, I mean, I still have it sometimes these days when we go out and it, and it's more sort of, you know, from the performance horse side where, you know, one of these trainers might be saying, look, I feed six kilograms of an XYZ product and I asked them a simple question. I said, okay, well, are your, are your horses ulcer free? And nine times out of 10, they'll say no. Are you having erratic behavior from horses? Yes, I am. Um, you know, other horses on on edge, obviously, you, you know, making it unsafe for your stable. Yes, I am. Um, and are your vet bills, you know, higher than X amount? Yes, they are. So then it's a simple question as well. You know, if you're feeding correctly, then why do you have these symptoms as a, as a byproduct of your current feed? Yeah. And we're here to try and lessen that. We know vet intervention is needed in acute situations, but we're more about that. Yes, you can treat them, but the chronic conditions that come up that can be helped with a better nutrient profile that works with the horse is a, is a lot better than a revolving amount of vet bills per month just treating for the sake of it and we all know and it's not picking on omeprazole or any of the the ulcer medications if a horse is on that for a prolonged amount of time there are side effects and we're working with vets that recognize this yeah 100 percent. and you know like the side effect of that is long term as i mentioned previously one of the podcasts is you do you do kill off the mitochondria and and you need mitochondria to produce energy so if you if you kill off enough of them then obviously your horse won't be able to produce the right amount of energy moving forward yeah and also the higher calcium demands as well so you've got 
up to 30% less calcium absorption. Calcium then has to come from bones. And when a horse needs to make their calcium levels more normal, if they're drawing it from the bones, they become weaker over time. That's very alarming in a performance horse. And look, to, to, to end us on that, it's it's all avoidable by having a balanced diet. And for look, we do offer for people, um, I think they're at 15, 20 minute uh, phone consults. So yeah, I either get myself, Magellan or Brian. Do you want to just go into that, Brian? Yeah, so when you jump on the website, we've got some slots there and you just fill out a, a short questionnaire outlining the real individual circumstances of your horse. So we know you have to analyze a diet for your particular environment your the genetics of the horse and their past life especially because as we've just talked about here metabolically they can be set up for failure from a real early age and you're reversing all that damage that's been done when when you get them at five or six or seven years particularly those off the track thoroughbreds so what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep your life simple by promoting a, a feed program that is all encompassing so a lot of the same clients go on the feed and the supplements where required. And we actually help you with your hay analysis and even blood tests if you've got a horse with a real bad chronic condition or, or disease. And just to end that also, uh, like nine times out of 10, you do work out to be more cost effective on the same program because we only add the supplements in extreme cases where it's needed. And, and we do focus more on feeding more roughage and obviously less hard feed. So when you, you know, for that particular performance horse trainer at six kilograms of, you know, xyz product to feed say three kilograms of our of our products it actually worked out to be more cost effective plus he got the healthier diet yeah and finally if you do have a laminitic prone horse we do have the solution for that with our our diet particularly the sensia 50 for the easy keepers for the harder keepers the send grain free which is they're both 100 percent grain free we're not any smoke and mirrors or any fillers hidden sugars in there it is what is stated and finally, not only with laminitis and metabolic conditions, but overall conditions in a horse, this line kind of struck a chord with me and it, and it goes like this. The feeding choices we make for our horses either puts them one step closer to health or one step closer to disease. And Peter and I, as owners of a nutrition company for horses, we cannot echo this loud enough because we see day in, day out clients or potential clients contact us with problems conditions diseases that are almost always related to the nutrition as root cause and getting those foundations right then other management principles can be put in so when we look at our whole feeding choice for our horses if we can just feed according to nature according to physiology they're going to have better lives in the long run yeah you're feeding for you know for prevention of disease in the long run yep 100 percent. so i think that one that about wraps up that one, Pete. I think that one was a bit of a long one, Brian. Yeah. We better let our listeners get back to the Chardonnays. <laughs> Pretty good, Pete. I think it's lunchtime for us. Yeah, time yeah. to go get some uh, get some healthy food, Brian. Yeah, yeah. And I think if anyone wants to reach out, we're available through the usual channels. Ten News Group is is a hive of activity on Facebook. On our website, you can contact us or even book a, a diet consult, which is really handy. Or even just reach for the phone and call us direct on the Sen HQ phone. And if you guys have a spare two minutes, we would really appreciate it if you do like the podcast to leave a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. There is a, a little button there to do that. And that's just going to help give exposure to other horse owners that are searching horse podcasts. Yeah, that's well summarised, Brian. Yeah. Thanks, guys. We'll have another podcast to you guys next week. Cheers. Thank you.